Welcome to The Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. Thank you for downloading from the BBC. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. BBC World Service. Today on The Why Factor, a mystery. We're shocked by horrible crimes. And yet, millions of us enjoy reading about crimes or watching them unfold on a screen. Why is crime fiction so popular? So, everybody, welcome to... Sherlock Holmes is London. We're starting here, next to this chap to my right, the bronze statue of Sherlock Holmes. When you look at him, you can see the very famous, iconic image of Sherlock Holmes. He's wearing his Inverness cape, he's also got on a deerstalker hat, and he has in his right hand a calabash pipe. And I can see that one young gentleman in my tour has come with his own deerstalker, which is absolutely lovely. It's a bright but chilly Saturday morning and 30 people from all over the world are in Baker Street, home to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's most famous creation. They've come to walk in the footsteps of a man who never existed, a violin-playing, opium-smoking, fictional detective. I started reading them when I was a child. I think the first one was The Hound of the Baskervilles when I was about ten. I loved being scared by it. (laughs) So I reread it whenever I want to have a good fright. I think it's just the the puzzle solving, really. uh, It sort of appeals, sort of intellectually, the the solving of the puzzle. I think it's just the mystery aspect of it. I like neat endings. I like to find out who done it. His deductive method, I would say. Like, he has to stare a person for, like, you know, 30 seconds. Based on his physical appearance, he can deduce where he comes from, what he does, or what his occupation is. So can you look at me and tell everything about me? Uh, you're probably from this country, based on your accent, and uh, you're probably some kind of, like, a TV slash radio media person. Well, that's easy, because I'm holding a microphone. <laughs> that's not a very great skill of deduction you're showing there. <laughs> I'm not Sherlock Holmes. I couldn't tell much more. <laughs> Dr. Watson, I have my eyes on a suite in Baker Street which will suit us down to the ground. You don't mind the smell of strong tobacco, I hope. I always smoke ships myself. That's good enough. And I generally have chemicals about and occasionally do experiments. Would that annoy you? By no means. Good. Now, let me see. What are my other shortcomings? The first Sherlock Holmes story, A Study in Scarlet, was published in 1887... It wasn't the first example of crime fiction, but it was immediately popular and it led to the creation of hundreds of other fictional sleuths with crimes to solve. The Mysterious Affair at Styles. Mystery Mile. The Nine Tailors. Murder on the Orient Express. Look to the Lady. Strong Poison. The Body in the Library. By the 1920s and 30s, Britain was at the centre of a golden age of detective fiction. Writers like Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers were producing tightly plotted but genteel whodunits. Death of a Ghost. Striding Folly. The Secret Adversary. Flowers for the Judge. Unnatural Death. Murder on the Nile. And soon the genre spread across the world. We arrived at the third floor house of Harrison Road. Next to the door was a brass nameplate which read Bomkesh Bakshi, Truth Seeker. Bomkesh turned to me and said, Welcome, step inside the poor man's hut. I asked him, Truth Seeker, what is that? That is my designation. Detective doesn't sound right. The Bengali word Goenda is worse. That is why I have given myself this designation. Truth seeker. Is it not correct? To 
So there was this first figure of this detective in the novels written by Sharodindu Bandopadhyay. He's a very popular Bengali fiction writer. So he's created this new Bengali detective called Bomkesh Bakshi. This Bengali detective lived in Calcutta, West Bengal, and he would solve cases primarily set in Calcutta and around. Replina Bose teaches English literature at the University of Delhi. Calcutta was the new modern city, the first of its kind, you know, in in that entire region. So people from all over were coming and migrating. 40s especially because due to the partition and the division of Bengal, lots and lots of people from Bangladesh, East Pakistan then came and started settling into Calcutta. So suddenly it was like this you know flux of people and who had no money, so the crimes were increasing. Murders were like rampant. There were ex-convicts. Police was barely like keeping up. So you needed a person who was separate from the police and somebody who was also very, very smart, who was an intellectual in that sense. And Bomkesh simply fit the bill. And what kind of cases did he solve? Interesting cases. In fact, one was a case which was called um, Chidiya Khana, which means the zoo. And this is where Bomkesh has to travel out into the suburbs, where there is a home where ex-convicts have come and basically settled. It's like a rehabilitation home. And there is a murder in the rehabilitation home. And there are some 25 or 30 suspects. All of them are ex-convicts. So almost everybody is a potential suspect. And slowly and after staying for like 20, 25 days, Bomkesh finally solves the case. And who is one of the, of course, ex-convicts, but you never know it's him till the very end. This particular novel was very, very popular among the Bengali audience. And why do you think that he was such a popular figure? I think because he was the first ever Indian figure. There have been other figures afterwards, but at that time, 1940s, a man who's wearing a dhoti, which is an Indian costume, and solving cases and making the city a better place. It was almost like a superhero. Just like Sherlock and other memorable detectives, Bumkesh Bakshi has a sidekick and a signature look. In his case, a long skirt-like dhoti. That was the 1940s, which was the time when the Indian freedom movement was also at its peak, which meant that people were trying to carve an indigenous identity, you know, a local hero. I mean, which is not quite Gandhi, but somebody who's like local and who would solve your local problems and who would also be Swadeshi movement, which is that wear your own clothes, the rejection of factory produced stuff from England, right? In that context, Bomkesh wearing dhoti is so important. In fact, even today, the, all the adaptations of Bomkesh, you'd see that he is wearing a dhoti. Crime is a tool to talk about some important things. You use the crime also to keep the reader reading until the last page and telling him or her what you wanted to tell. Gianrico Carafilio is a politician and a former anti mafia judge. His 2004 novel, A Walk in the Dark, addressed a problem that Italy was struggling to confront, violence against women by their former partners. I know that there was a lot of debate after the publication of the book because uh, we didn't have a law about stalking. And after this long debate, uh, we approved a law, in, uh, I think, in 2009 or 2008. And that uh, really, really is helping. And uh, I have to say that I'm pleased that this book helped to... Uh, write a good law against stalking and uh, yes I like very much the idea of um, staying on the underdog side My latest book Black Widow Society it's very strong female characters who form this kind of vigilante secret society because they are in physically or emotionally abusive relationships Angela Makolwa is one of just a handful of black South African crime writers. Some of them got into the society because they truly were in danger. They were in danger of being killed by their husbands or raising their kids in these violent homes. So then they carry out what they call eliminations when they eliminate their errant husbands. Um, <laughs> they've got a very classic way of carrying out everything. Are we meant to feel sorry for them, to think that they are wrong? How are we meant to feel about them? We are meant to, first of all, think about domestic violence and gender-based violence as a whole and 
how it can push people who are physically vulnerable to a point of desperation because physically it's very difficult for a woman to fight a man and actually win (laughs) that fight. So if you're in a relationship like that, you're not going to just walk out the door. You feel oppressed, you feel trapped and you're manipulated, those kind of issues. You can't justify killing You cannot under any circumstances. So there is that kind of big moral question. You know, if you treat me badly, am I supposed to turn the other cheek? Am I supposed to walk away? Am I supposed to fight back, even if it means fight you to the death? South African crime fiction is a fairly recent development. And crime fiction by black South Africans is even more recent. Why do you think that is? I still struggle with it, writing crime in the current criminal justice setup that we have here, because people still feel that the law is kind of impotent to protect them in the context of apartheid. I mean, obviously, the police were like your worst enemy. You wouldn't even think to call on them uh, for protection because you were the target. It was kind of racial profiling, but obviously it was enforced by law at the time. It's slightly different now because obviously we are functioning within a democracy, but still there are those gaps in terms of seeing law enforcement as something that is there to serve you as a citizen and that will bring you justice. So could you have in South Africa today a good guy detective that we get in many other countries? (sighs) If things change in this country, maybe I would be inspired by the reason that I've deliberately not tackle that aspect of crime, meaning like police investigation, is because of my lack of faith in that system. A similar lack of faith is explored in Leonardo Shasha's groundbreaking novel about the Sicilian mafia, The Day of the Owl. That's an interesting novel because you have an ending, but the detective is defeated. Giliola Sulis is an expert in Italian crime fiction. So he's given a scapegoat to be put to prison and then he's sent back to his region of Emilia. So there is not a satisfactory end because society is as wrong as it was before. So it's complete reversal of the classical detective story where the detective identifies the wrong guy in society, brings him to prison and therefore society goes back to an ideal situation where everybody's good, more or less. Here is the opposite. The guy who's doing things wrong is the detective because he's breaking the code of silence, of omerta, and therefore he's changing social rules, and this is not acceptable. Captain Bellodi was pacing the streets of his native city, but uppermost in his mind was the thought of far-off Sicily, with its burden of injustice and death. He had just learned that his whole painstaking reconstruction of the SKs had collapsed, like a house of cards blown apart by irresistible alibis. Of one alibi in particular, Diego Marquicas. Persons above all suspicion had borne witness to the sheer impossibility of Diego shooting Colas Berna, as he had been 76 kilometres away when the crime was committed. This testimony could be confirmed not only by the doctor, but by peasants and passers-by, sure as they all were of Diego's identity. And when Shasha wrote that ending, was that just an interesting ending, or was he really getting at something about Italian society? He was definitely getting something about Italian society at the time. He was assuming that we want to have a nice ending because we want to close a crime fiction book and feel we are on the right side and we are satisfied that everything is fine and we don't have to do anything for that. Why Shasha's point was that the reader has to take responsibility. So he is told by the writer that there is something deeply wrong in society, but he cannot just close the book and go back to his or her own life. He should take action outside the book in the reality to change things, and each of us should take responsibility. And is that a message Italian crime writers today are also giving to their readers? Yes, and they're doing so with even more strength because they believe that, for example, investigative journalism is dead. So what some of these writers do is to do a preliminary investigation on a certain problem of society and then 
write a novel about it, uh, trying to disguise uh, the elements that would link directly to people. So they change names, obviously. They have lawyers working in them so that reality is recognizable, but they cannot be brought to court. This fictionist denunciation is a very different approach from the reassuring golden age crime fiction of the 1930s and 40s, including the Indian golden age detective Bomkesh Bakshi. Ruplina Bose. Order is restored in the end. That's absolutely compulsory. Because in a way, the detective stories also sort of tackled superstition and a lot of like beliefs which were not modern. Conclusion is very important. Nothing is left in the realm of unexplained or supernatural. They all come to their logical conclusion. Yes, the classical crime novel is like that. You read this kind of novel where everything is okay when the, the book is over, everything is neat, and you feel okay, the world looks less uh, dangerous. The Italian crime writer Gianrico Carofilio. From my point of view, they are like drops for anxiety, like a medicine. You feel anxious about the world all around and then you read this kind of novels where everything is neat, everything is okay when the, the story is over and you feel okay and the world seems uh, less menacing, uh, but uh, they are not about the real world. Of course, the real world doesn't have neat endings, and sometimes people do get away with murder. Some writers distract us from this truth, others force us to confront it. Perhaps the most extreme example of an unsettling ending is That Awful Mess in Merulana Street by the Italian writer Carlo Emilio Gadda. This is an incredible novel set in Rome, in a block of flats. A series of crimes happen, and there is an investigator who tries to understand what's going on, but the plot is continuously lost, so we never find the culprit, and when we find one, there are more things happening. But when we reach the end, the book is unfinished. We feel we are very close to the truth. But you but never find out who killed them? No, the book stops all of a sudden. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.